So, as Zichan said, I'm Tom Santero. I'm a software engineer at a company called Helium Systems. Uh, we're sort of an IoT startup. We connect things to the internet. And yes, I know computers are already things that are on the internet. We sort of like make smaller things. Uh, they're kind of like sensors, and we actually connect them to other things that aren't on the internet, but our sensors are on the internet. So we're sort of like an internet of things on the internet connected to things that are not on the internet. But I guess that's not really buzzy. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, yes, I defected and moved away from New York City a couple months ago. I live in Colorado, where the weed is legal and pretty cheap. <laughs> I smoked a fucking lot of it during this talk. <laughs> but yeah, no, I am honored to be here. Uh, I really do love being back in New York. It's really exciting for me every time that I do come back. And the fact that it's a Papers We Love night on top of that is even better. The fact that I'm the speaker makes me a little uneasy, but you know, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but uh, I'm going to get a couple of logistics and thank yous and all that nonsense out of the way. So first off, a uh, big shout out and thanks to Zishan and all of the rest of the Papers We Love uh, hosts for inviting me and subjecting all of you to what I have to say. Um, and... Fucking Linux. Uh, and also a huge shout out to someone who can't be here but wanted to, Chris Micklejohn. He's actually the person who gave me the idea to have this uh, uh, paper uh, as the topic of the discussion tonight. Uh, we were in a bar in San Francisco and discussing a lot of things as one does at a bar. And this paper happened to be one of the things that came up as being probably one of the most interesting, potentially important, and yet completely unsighted and unrepresented paper in all of the realm of computer science, at least. Uh, and despite the fact that it is a Lamport paper, it's kind of shocking. So, to quote Papers We Love presenter numero uno, Mike Bernstein, in his bio when he does a talk, he says, I'm interested in the intersection of philosophy and computer science. I am too, Mike. We love you, bud. We miss you here. If you're watching this on YouTube, good luck with the papers, uh, with the pizza book. Um, but yeah, so, Ryan Zizeski, another Papers We Love New York speaker, coined this term, philosophy science. Um, if you were at Strange Loop or watched a video from the keynote, Philip Wadler, earlier this year, he said, you know, real science doesn't put science in his name, you know? Uh, <laughs> and I'm not here to suggest that philosophy science is a real thing, but it's, what started as a joke from Ryan actually sort of fermented in my mind while I was working on this talk over the past couple of weeks. And uh, a little background on me, I actually studied philosophy until I eventually dropped out of undergrad. Um, and there's going to be a little bit of philosophy in this talk. And what I mean by philosophy science when I say it, tongue-in-cheek uh, notwithstanding, is that you know, it's not the science of philosophy or the philosophy of science, but rather it's the applicability of what we do in an industry, whether that industry happen to be computer engineering or uh, botany or whatever other science that we have, but it's the things that we learn from the tools of our trade that we could actually then apply to our understanding of the world around us. And that's that intersection of computer science and philosophy that Mike talks about, I think. Uh, that's what it feels to me. And I actually particularly chose this specific paper because of the philosophy science that we're going to do. Uh, I think it's a great candidate for, uh, for a philosophy science paper. Um, so, on Lamport's uh, papers page, he discusses that the impetus, the, the origin of uh, the topic of this paper was simply an occurrence. We could probably assume that he was driving in his car one day, uh, he was approaching an intersection, and the light turned from yellow, uh, or rather from red to gr from wrong colors, <laughs> Uh, turned from green to yellow, and there was a, probably a split-second decision that he had difficulty in what, whether or not he should speed up or slow down to stop. Uh, and he related it back to a problem that he had written about a couple of years earlier called the glitch problem. Uh, for those of you who aren't electrical engineers, uh, a circuit is basically a complex array of gates and wires that you send electricity through, which is pretty cool. Uh, and uh, there's this arbiter problem, this glitch phenomena that actually occurs and occurred for decades before the, the glitch problem paper was even published uh, where 
uh, there's the chance that the arbiter at the end of the circuit can't tell if you're sending uh, the electron through if it should represent a one or a zero. Uh, the difficulty with this is that it only has a certain amount of time and a lot of time to actually make this decision. And so uh, when it doesn't come to a decision, it used to cause uh, uh, faults in the computers that most of these devices were connected to. So if I don't know if you guys remember computing in the 80s and the 90s, all the things that just happened out of nowhere that seemed to be wrong, possibly not always related to software, uh, bad programming practices. And so I think this is a pretty good candidate because, uh, as I said, it's Lamport taking just a very casual observation and recognizing the tangents uh, and the correspondence that it had to computer science and bringing it all in together so that we could have a better understanding, hopefully, about the world we live in and maybe even possibly contribute to the great conversation and, uh, and advance the state of not computer science or math or physics, but of uh, humanity and understanding who we are and where we are. Whoops. So this talk is in five parts. Um, I'm going to say ass a lot. Half the reason why I chose the paper. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I did want to give a little bit of background. Raise your hand uh, if you've read the paper. Liars. <laughs> it's only six pages. Is it? <laughs> uh, I do want to give you a little bit of background on the paradox of Burdine's ass, just so we know why we're talking about a whole bunch of asses and impossibility results re uh, revolving around them. So, like most things in Western civilization, it goes back to the Greeks. This is Aristotle. I wrote it in Greek just to mess with you guys. Um, and so, Aristotle is an interesting figure. He was actually writing in a time post-Peloponnesian War, which was post the Persian Wars, where the Greek city-states actually came all together and defeated the invading Persians. Then they had a problem, which they solved with war amongst themselves, on who's going to rule the world now that we just defeated the greatest army ever. Um, and so, this is relevant and contextual only because there are a lot of people running around Athens and Sparta and whatnot telling those with money, those in power, how the world works, what to do with their power and their money, uh, and it had a lot of influence. And so this particular quote from Aristotle from one of his metaphysical works on the heavens says that a man being just hungry and thirsty uh, and placed be in between food and drink must necessarily remain where he is and starve to death. So what he's talking about is this sophist notion that because the world is circular, is a sphere, and the Greeks knew this because of Ptolemy, we didn't find this out in 1492 like the history books tell us, uh, because the world is circular, the sophists were suggesting that they must be, uh, the world must be under equal uh, forces from all different sides at once, and thus the Earth is stationary, does not move. And Aristotle says, you guys are out of your mind, so he insulted them by saying a man just being hungry and thirsty, placed in between equal forces, uh, between food and drink, is going to starve and to, uh, and to die of thirst all at the same time. I'm not sure if that's possible, but it's an insult nonetheless. <laughs> then comes this guy, Jean Bledin. 14th century priest, philosopher, writing in the time of early Christian philosophy, uh, contemporaries like St. Thomas Aquinas. They were very familiar with the works of Aristotle at this time. Uh, just so happens that there's a very strong correspondence between Aristotle's ethics and his metaphysics and uh, Christian philosophy and the teachings of the New Testament. So they relied on Aristotle a lot. And in actually writing about the problems of free will and moral determinism, Buridan suggested that should two courses of action be judged equal, uh, and the will, the free will, cannot break that deadlock, all you could do is suspend judgment until the circumstances change, and then you'll know the right way to act. Uh, this is a problem of morality that extends to today. You know, we see this very same problem being discussed in Kant in the imper uh, categorical imperative, but. Erdan's critics and his contemporaries weren't so nice. So they remembered Aristotle and that man who was placed equidistant between water and food. And they suggested that Burdan was an ass. 
and he was placed equidistant between water and, and a bale of hay and would ultimately starve to death. And this, in my opinion, is probably one of the oldest trolls in Western civilization. Uh, <laughs> you know, this, this particular occurrence is at least 600 years old, but it goes all the way back to the days of Aristotle. But, you know, like a lot of memes, they get changed over time, and so eventually, you know, the, the bucket of water became another equal bale of hay. But what I do think is cool, and you'll know this because I read everything about Buridan's ass and principle online before this talk, is that there's examples over history of lots of famous people using the insult of Buridan's ass. I'd like to share one with you. Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> I chose this picture because uh, no shave November. Um, <laughs> But yeah, this is in 1848, Lincoln basically calling a Democratic presidential candidate an ass on the floor of the Senate uh, by saying, Mr. Speaker, we have heard all of the animals standing uh, in doubt between two stacks of hay and surviving to death, starving to death. The like would never happen at General Cass, placed the stacks a thousand miles apart, and he would stand stock midway between them and eat them both, and the green grass along the line would apt to suffer some two at the same time. God, and you see the debates today. <laughs> so, oldest troll in history as far as I know. Part two, we're going to actually talk about the paper now. Uh, in this part, we're going to go through a mathematical proof that's offered on the very first page. Hopefully, everyone will be on the same page by the time we're done with that part. Then we're going to go through a majority of the examples that relate this problem of Burdan's ass, formalized as Burdan's principle that Lamport provides us, so that we could have a better understanding of exactly what the mechanics of this problem are. And then uh, we're going to talk about some of the issues with this problem in particular. And I'm going to be so bold as to suggest other asses that Lamport didn't mention in the paper. We'll see how that goes. So, as a former philosophy student, I kind of phrased this in the terms of uh, a Euclidean geometry problem. So if we were given, if we were given, yeah, if we were given an ass and two equal bales of hay, Lamport's proposition is, is that if we place this ass equidistant between each bill of hay, there's going to be some finite starting positions for the ass such that it could possibly starve to death before making a decision. Here's a proof. So if we were to let x represent the starting position of our ass at time t, x falls along a line conjoining uh, the two bales. And if we were to consider the positions of the two bales of hay, 0 and 1, we now know that x exists such that it's less than uh, or it's greater than 0, but less than 1. So for the rest of the proofs in this paper, we're going to consider the position of the, uh, of the ass is uh, a of t to, uh, uh, to x. Um, and so this is basically a function over time of our continuous position. Ah, fonts. OK, so that box is supposed to be the upside down a that represents for all. Sorry. Uh, so basically, after our initial starting position at zero, for all, all time after that, we know two things are certain. We simplify the problem by saying, if uh, at any given time after zero, the ass is in the position of zero, where one of the bales of hay is, uh, we know that uh, amount of time has passed. Similarly for, for, uh, for one. But what that also means is that there also exists uh, a finite range of real numbers in between 0 and 1 for any time that's greater than our very first initial starting point, past 0, where the ass's position can be between 0 and 1. Does that make sense? It's like the old age-old questions, like every time you take a step, uh, take a you know, half a distance from the, the previous step, and you'll never reach the end point. So like, that's basically the same principle at play. It's a concept of continuity. Uh, so there must be a finite range of values for the position of our ass, such that the end position after a certain amount of time isn't at 0 or 1. 
It's pretty clear, right? Blank stairs. Yes? It's finite. I drew it for those of you who aren't mathematically inclined. And I actually paid $5 for that picture of that donkey. <laughs> I'm the ass. But we generalize the problem, or Lamport does, generalizes the problem at hand uh, and suggests that when making a discrete decision based upon an input having a continuous range of values, uh, cannot be made within a bounded length of time. What? I'm not so sure about this personally. What do you guys think? It's suspect, right? It gives us some, some more examples beyond the ass. But first, since I forgot my slides, uh, this is the problem that I have uh, with this, is the whole introduction of continuity into the problem and suggesting that there's going to be some bounded length on time for which there is some sort of momentum, some sort of input for which the ass will actually starve simply because you couldn't traverse distance enough. It doesn't, it's, it seems counterintuitive. Uh, I, uh, the difficulty is I don't have a PhD in quantum mechanics, so I'm not an expert on continuity. So like he says in the paper, I'm just going to take his word for it for the time being. We're gonna discuss continuity a little bit later in this talk. So, more on to the asses that sort of try to exemplify the problem a little bit. The next one's a train. <laughs> so for those of you in the audience who aren't laughing, this is the real train that runs through the street that I live on. Uh, and it's got a 115 decibel uh, air, air horn. <laughs> I didn't know this when they were showing me the apartment. <laughs> and so when some friends of mine happened to visit Colorado, coincidentally I wasn't there, starting then and ever since, I get nothing but train jokes on Twitter. <laughs> and the fact that this paper has a train example. But this was the only example that wasn't diagrammed, so I drew one for you. So what's going on here? So, Basically, Lamport states that instead of an ass starving to death, which is kind of like a contrived example, what if we were to consider a real human experience, very much like the one that he was, uh, may have experienced when he was connecting the glitch phenomena with this concept of Burdan's ass. He says, if you're driving down the road and you happen to be coming upon uh, a crossing where train tracks run, you're uh, moving in a particular direction you're moving in a particular direction, uh, the train's coming at you, and there are certain possibilities where uh, you might not be able to make a decision based on a very short amount of time whether or not it's gonna be safe for you to continue driving at the current velocity or stop because you might get uh, crushed by the train. So mathematically, using the same uh, predicates that we saw earlier, uh, we have a couple of different things going on here. So first off, the intersection where the road, where the road meets the train tracks, uh, which is sort of shaded in what used to be red, uh, shows, shows the position of the ass at time zero uh, and that the X denotes uh, the position of the ass in this time, it's the driver of the car. Uh, and if the train happens to also be in this intersection at the same time, He's gonna not starve to death, but he's gonna get squished and die, right? But if the time at position X is much less than zero, so much less than when the train's in the intersection, which is at time zero in this particular example, then the driver will know that to just stop at the stop sign, check to see if it's all clear, and then keep going. Similarly, if time is much greater than zero for position X, uh, the driver is long gone, he's already p driven through uh, the intersection before the trains actually come. So those were you know, the givens in this particular proof. But there exists some point, and I tried to demonstrate it in this little area here, right before the critical section, that there, are, there exists the possibility that a driver might not make a decision continue at his current speed, uh, pace and velocity, 
not knowing whether or not he's going to get hit by the train or not and basically die. Lamport in the paper actually says that these are probably the particular incidents where it just doesn't make sense that you know a car got hit by a train or whatever. Why didn't they stop? What were they thinking? They weren't drunk. You know, tox screen came back. But this actually does happen, and this is in some of the notes that uh, Lamport wrote on his webpage about publishing this paper. Uh, some of those few examples that may exist uh, where Burdan's principle actually affects our our real lives. Again, in this particular example, we're still relying on the concept of continuity being a factor. Uh, the interesting about this example is that it's a little contrived still. Uh, the driver is only going in a single direction. This is a one-dimensional problem. Um, and uh, I don't know. I still have trouble with it. Our next example. We're driving still. This time, we have two dimensions of choice, whether or not to go left or right when, for some reason, there's a tree right in the middle of the road. Right? So when I first saw this diagram in the paper, it was actually a little bit difficult for me. So then I remembered it's a Lamport paper. So pro tip, the arrows show you the direction of what's going. So you know, that example is actually from the time clocks in order of events and distributed systems. Uh, but yeah, you know, if I were to draw a time diagram, it would probably go from left to right, well, for you guys, left to right. Uh, but Lamport goes up a lot. Um, but yeah, so what we have now is a continuous function of uh, time over our initial position as we're driving uh, toward the tree, and we could either bear to the left or to the right. This one's a little bit more realistic. It's a little bit more straightforward. Um, Personally, I think uh, he would have been better to use an example of a deer uh, in the middle of the road. And when you stop to think about it, this is actually kind of what brings it home to me in, in recognizing that, well, maybe Lamport's not completely full of it and that Burdan's principle does affect us as human beings where there are certain times when if a deer just hops out right in the middle of the road while we're driving down, there's a very, maybe even infinitesimal small uh, but still very small uh, amount of time where we can't avoid a collision simply because we don't have enough time to uh, go from left to right and to avoid it. We end up smacking the thing and it's really bad. Um, but this example adds another element. He suggests that, well, what if the driver were to just stop, right? You stop before the tree, you're not going to hit it. If you stop before the tree, you now have expanded the amount of time that you have to make the decision. So it's not exactly a counterexample to what he claims to be Burdan's principle, simply because when you actually stop, you're delaying the decision. Burdan's principle still played, but until you actually stopped, the, you're not making a decision anymore, a binary choice between going left or going right. You're actually deciding uh, that you want to prolong the decision. Now, this is particularly OK in the example of a tree or a deer in the, uh, in the headlights. Or, and since it's a deer in my example, we could bring it back to the ass problem and put an ass in the highway. But it still doesn't feel right. I still feel unconvinced of the validity of Burdan's principles, principle after these real life examples. Oops. This one I have experienced. <laughs> I actually experienced it like three times on my way here. <laughs> so he says, uh, in addition to, uh, so he expands upon the tree example and says that the mechanism for actually making the decision is irrelevant uh, in the entire equation. And he says it could be the tree making the decision not to move or the driver in the car. That doesn't really make sense, so he says, all right, Alice and Bob are walking down the street. Raise your hand if you experience this. You're walking towards someone. You don't know whether to go left or right. You walk right into that person, or almost into that person. All right, cool. More people than read the paper. <laughs> and so 
Well, the consequences of this are is that we're still relying upon making a decision within a very uh, within a bounded uh, amount of time, and it doesn't matter if we're the ones making the decision or if it's somebody else making the decision. It's very similar to the observability problem, uh, which is uh, a concept of quantum mechanics that I'm not going to go into, but can relate to what our profession is. I imagine most of us in here are programmers, so uh, if you've ever worked with large-scale systems and you've attempted to collect metrics over what's going on, uh, it's the same problem as uh, trying to sample uh, you know, the state of your systems without interfering with them. And if you're dealing with enough load, well, it's the same question. So it doesn't matter what's being observed or what's making the decision, but rather the impossibility of a small amount of time to actually make certain decisions in our lives. I promised Colin that I would skip this. <laughs> it, for you. There's a lot more math involved in this one, and I actually had like four slides explaining it all, but I decided not to, so we're gonna skip the flying asses. <laughs> we're actually gonna talk about the, uh, the more interesting uh, part of the paper, in my opinion, is the continuity. The, the place where it all seems to like, not make sense, unless you're Lamport, I guess. <laughs> Spurdan's principle does not rely upon any assumption about how a decision is made, as we've just explored but it rests only on the assumption of continuity. Party foul. So we got two choices, again. We could give up making a discrete decision and make continuous decisions, <laughs> uh, or we could basically take off the timeout uh, and we allow an unbounded length of time to make our decisions. But that still assumes that we're dealing with a continuous range, and you know, even that is questionable, even in the very uh, initial example. Question is, how much trust do I want to point, uh, put in Lamport in this one? He's never really given me a reason to doubt him before. Time clocks and ordering of events in distributed systems, logical clocks, uh, mutual exclusion, Paxos, Byzantine generals problem. Uh, Lamport's done a lot for my career, personally. <laughs> I don't know about you guys. But you can't give someone everyone. I want everything. I want to believe, though. The truth is out there. And the question of whether or not this is incredibly valid is... It's interesting. So, if we recall, the original problem was observing that there was a issue that Lamport experienced in his career in observing that uh, sometimes an arbiter can't make a decision in time and it would cause computer systems to crash. So this issue was actually revisited by Professors Anderson and Gouda in the late 80s. And he said that yes, the glitch phenomenon is real. It's inherent in arbiters so maybe it's not a problem of continuity. And what they actually do in this particular paper is that they model these issues uh, with the glitch problem using discrete circuits instead of, a, uh, instead of continuous circuits. And they still show that this phenomenon is unavoidable even if you eliminate that continuity issue. So what's the deal? It's starting to get there, right? So of the only papers, aside from the one I just showed, that actually cite Buridan's principle that makes any sense is, oh hey, another Lamport paper. <laughs> uh, and actually talking about synchronization inside of circuits that are, are arbiter free, and he actually talks about this paper that talked about his paper. And he says that the impossibility of building a bounded time arbiter seems to be a fundamental law of physics. Seems to be a fundamental law of physics and not a mathematical theorem. Well, great, you made me do all that math for nothing. <laughs> and then he references this paper, and he says that a bounded time arbiter can't be constructed by certain types of components, 
But it doesn't talk about that. One other thing that I talked about in the paper that I haven't talked about yet either, because I'm ringleader here. Uh, and basically, uh, quantum mechanical arbiters still rely on continuity. So basically, what he's saying is that, okay, this paper makes sense. You could model your circuits uh, as being discrete and not continuous, but that doesn't invalidate what I said about Buridan's principle. And specifically, by virtue of the fact that you can't demonstrate that the quantum mechanical arbiter still suffers uh, from Buridan's principle for reasons other than continuity, I still have reason to believe that my initial preposition was correct. So this gave me a little bit more faith, but I'm skating on thin ice here. Here's a quantum mechanical arbiter. This is pretty cool. How I imagine it works, right? This dotted line is the path that an electron takes, right? So these two things on either side of this path at A are fixed state magnets. They sort of stabilize our electron as it tra traverses through. Now B here is an accelerator. It's coming through and it just blasts it as fast as it can through C, which have dynamic polarity. Uh, they could give a bias of the electron either a north or a south pole uh, according to those magnets. And what it's then going to do is hit these detectors, uh, which are going to then determine if we're talking about a 1 or a 0 in our circuits, or whatever how a com quantum computer looks like. And the problem actually still holds. Uh, even after Lamport wrote this paper in 84 and then republished in 2011 in the supplemental section at the end, he says that no advances in quantum mechanics have yet still disproven this. And what goes on here is that in continuity, we're talking about limits. That's what we concern ourselves. Uh, we've got Heisenberg's uncertainty principle telling us that we can't understand what's going on with a particle in both its position and its momentum uh, simultaneously, measuring one detracts from the other. So when this particle comes through, what we're measuring is basically the limit uh, upon which it's close enough to D0, that bale of hay, or D1 of this uh, uh, bale of hay. If it's got, if it has enough velocity, if it has enough, enough bias, there's a possibility it could skip both of those on either side. It could go straight through. At, precisely the right mount where the detector actually can't pick it up. Might be a convenience of quantum mechanics, but it seems from this particular example that Buridan's principle as originally formulated by Lamport seems to hold water. I don't have a quantum mechanical arbiter to prove it though. And so from this he actually derives Buridan's law of measurement. If in this particular example, x and z represent d0 and d1. If x is less than y, which is less than z, then any measurement performed in a bounded length of time that has a non-zero probability of yielding a value in a probability of x and a non-zero probability of yielding a value in a neighborhood of z, then there must be uh, also some probability of yielding a value in a neighborhood of y. You could show a counterexample to Burdan's uh, uh, principle by measuring the results and seeing if something is less than or greater than y. If it is, but not equal to z or x, well, then it still holds. All right. This is where I dive off the deep end in this talk. That's pretty much the paper. I'm still uncomfortable with it as, well, the rest of you probably should be. Uh, either that's because I explained it really poorly, uh, we don't know quantum mechanics enough or the mathematics involved in keeping up with Lamport and what he's uh, supposed. Or rather, none of the examples really sat right with me. Unless, of course, the flying ass is for Colin. It made sense mathematically, but it, it still seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? That as a free agent, as, as, a, as a physical mechanism in the world that's, that's 
subject to the laws of physics and thus continuity, that there exists moments in my life where I'm unable to come to a decision uh, based upon uh, the fact that I'm dealing with a continuous stream of uh, outputs within a, a lot of amount of time. Then I started thinking. Like I mentioned, I looked at all of the papers that this particular uh, paper cites, and I didn't really come up with anything, so I had to come up with my own examples. And so what was one of the main takeaways of this paper? Well, decisions sometimes take longer than we expect, and that's something that I could live with. Indecision could be considered harmful. Bad things happen if we don't make a decision. The ass dies. And there are certain circumstances where we cannot prolong choice. Does this remind you of anything? I don't know about you guys, but I work with distributed systems a lot. So entropy ain't what it used to be. Wah wah. Uh, <laughs> Randomness, uh, Lamport says earlier in the paper, makes it possible so that we can't deliberately starve the ass. So the ass could randomly choose arbitrarily to go to zero or to one. But what are some systems that we could think of that indecision would be harmful and uh, waiting a long time might not be right? Oh, what's up, FLP? <laughs> <laughs> So for those of you who haven't read this paper, do it. Uh, this is from 1985, going back to the future in the past, Marty. Um, and basically, if you have processes P and processes Q, and you're communicating over an asynchronous network, there is the impossibility of forming consensus, a weak consensus, but still consensus, if one of these processes happen to fail. So what do we do with our consensus algorithms? We introduce timeouts, we introduce leader elections, we introduce all of these arbitrary rules and guards and bounds so that we could uh, continue operating correctly. So we introduce randomness, <laughs> wasn't me. <laughs> we introduce randomness for correctness. And if you stop to think about it in this regard, there's a whole, plethora of systems that exist beyond just computer asses uh, in which this actually holds true. Uh, it's an election year next year. <laughs> but the problem of consensus uh, is you have to get a whole bunch of components to agree on a proposed value where all of those values that had been proposed uh, are proposed by members of our group and we must eventually decide a value. So indecision is considered harmful in the sense that we sacrifice, uh, 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 we won't terminate in, in consensus according to FLP if we wait forever for a message that's never going to arrive. And by virtue of the fact that uh, link failure is indistinguishable, indistinguishable from host failure, uh, we might possibly wait forever and so we can't get strong consistency for free by just cranking up our timeouts and waiting a little bit longer. Uh, on the flip side, we must always eventually make a decision, uh, and by doing so, uh, that eliminates those possibilities where uh, it's potentially uh, we're never going to get a result, but maybe if we waited a little longer. Uh, so. What I'm proposing, basically, is that asynchronous message passing uh, is basically a continuous function of our initial state, so P at state of X sends message to process Q and expects a response. So we want to update our own internal state with the response that we get, but we only have a bounded amount of time to do so. So Berdan's reliable failure detector is basically a process that can't make a discrete decision about the state of another process based upon having an input of continuous range of values and a bounded length of time. Am I on time? You gave me the time signal earlier. Someone behind you did. Yeah. <laughs> All right. 
So another example uh, are in distributed systems, which is something I'm a lot more comfortable with than quantum mechanics, uh, are Byzantine faults and Byzantine failures. This is when uh, our processes may lie to us about what the state of the current world is. Um, and so Burdan's principle says that injecting randomness, injecting things like timeouts and leader elections in, this, in the realm of, uh, of uh, consensus algorithms can prevent us from intentionally starving. What about the cases where we accidentally starve? You know, if the ass is just stupid and doesn't make a decision even though we give it a nudge in one direction or the other. So this happens too. Anyone ever hear of the raft consensus algorithm? Yeah. So, raft can't survive Byzantine vaults. It's strange that people are building databases that are supposed to be geo-replicated on top of raft, but it's none of my business. So it's a Byzantine fault in raft specifically. Well, it could do a couple of things. It could live lock. What does that mean? Let's say we have an asymmetric partition. We've got, f ah, I get to use a whiteboard. This is great. I love using whiteboards. All right. All right, here's our consensus group. A, B, C, D, and E. That's gonna make it nice and confusing. All right, so we've got a partition such that D could only talk to B, and E can only talk to C. A is our leader. So for those of you who aren't familiar in the Raft Consensus pro Protocol, every node in the system is basically a, a state machine with a replicated block. And uh, leaders are, as it says, the source of truth. And if you want to come to consensus, everything has to be proposed. Uh, uh, all, all, all values are committed through the leader to the followers and so on and so forth. But we have a mechanism that's completely random that says, okay, I'm gonna have a fault detector that's based off of heartbeats. And every time I send a ping to another node, there's some bounded amount of time, either 300 to 500 milliseconds, I think it was in, uh, in, the, in the paper. Uh, for every interval of that, uh, we're going to determine to see if there's still uh, liveness among the leader and other nodes in the system. And if D is asymmetrically partitioned from A with E in the same boat, but the rest seeing each other, what's going to happen is any leader in the, in the system, or I'm sorry, any follower in the system uh, could suggest that we elect a new leader. So D is gonna say, hey B, A is dead. Let me be leader. E's gonna do the same thing. The response from B since he can see A, he's gonna say, no, A is still alive, continue with your work. But the problem is, in making that response, an entire new election cycle to become leader has been proposed and then propagated to all of the nodes. So what that basically means is that until these partitions go away, these nodes are going to continuously start re-electing leaders. And for safety, because we require agreement across a majority of, uh, of our nodes, a quorum, we're not ever going to allow any new rights into the system because we don't, we're in a metastable state. So that's live lock for you. There are a number of other issues that this particular algorithm is subject to and fails miserably in the realm of uh, Byzantine style failures where our components are lying to us. But this is a way that our asses can still accidentally starve. So, I don't know, for me at least, putting Buridan's principle within to the context of distributed systems and what I understand about FLP and what I understand about consensus algorithms, even eventually consistent uh, systems, makes it feel a little bit more plausible uh, where Within bounded time, there are possibilities where if a decision is not made, the ass dies. There are other areas of computer science that I suspect Burdan's principle is not only applicable, but probably could be explained a little bit better uh, than the examples that we both have in the paper as well as uh, 
It's my horrible whiteboarding. Um, and those are the areas of computability and topologies and category theory and, you know, all the new hot stuff uh, that I'm simply not qualified to discuss, so I won't. But think about this for a moment. And if you're inclined to agree, we'll get a drink after and you can tell me what you think. So with that, I'd like to open it up to questions, if you have any. Oh yeah, I gotta pass up. Oh, see Sean with that little mic. So, I'm really curious. Um, I'm gonna give him a good mic. Just repeat the question. I'll repeat the question. Okay, cool. So I'm wondering if you have a system where you're making a decision and you decide that like no matter what, you're always going to make the same decision every time. So that's when oh always sorry. Going to turn right. Okay. No matter what. So the question does the mic work now? Yeah. You want to repeat it so you're yeah. on video? Oh, I'll repeat it. So <laughs> let's say you have a system in which you make the same decision every single time without even thinking about it. So the idea is you're going and you always make a right to avoid the tree. Mm -hmm. Or any, you're, just, you're going in circles, but right. at least you're going forward. <laughs> so. <laughs> so that's a good question. Uh, Lamport discussed this in the paper, specifically in the example uh, with the train. And he says that, okay, every time that you come into uh, a crossing yard, uh, you stop. Well, if there's no train coming, well, that's pretty uh, ridiculous. And, you know, uh, odd infinitum, it gets really, really absurd. Uh, but when you stop to think about it, if you have uh, a predetermined, predisposed uh, position on what to do in light of certain events, uh, well, that's simply, in my opinion, injecting randomness into the equation. Uh, because you're not actually making the decision, you've already made the decision. Uh, you're m not making the decision at the spot. Uh, and so I think Burdan's principle, and I may be wrong, but I think Burdan's principle might suggest that there's still a condition, a very finite uh, amount of starting positions where you won't even be able to register or observe what's going on. Uh, and uh, you know that might be the case of you know driving down the car and the deer comes out of nowhere. You know, by the time that you register uh, that you have to make a decision, uh, you can't anymore because you ran over the deer yeah. and you killed the deer. You shouldn't kill deers. <laughs> I hope that answers it. Yes. Oh, you were asking a question, not telling me I was at a. Okay, or someone was. I get it now. Okay. So, I believe that, I know that humans, and myself included, suffer from indecision all the time. But I don't think I've ever actually seen an ass star. Is it possible we're just outsmarting ourselves? Again, the paper suggests that the fact that we don't have empirical evidence of starving asses all over the world doesn't preclude the truth of Burden's principle. <laughs> so, indecision in human terms and indecision in human terms when applied to quantum mechanics and uh, thinking about, uh, you know, momentum over time are certainly two different things. But experiencing that indecision of whether or not you want to speed up or slow down when you're going through, uh, you know, what potentially may be a red light uh, is simply a matter of the fact that we're bounding the decision that we make over time. Not that we can't ever make a decision. Again, if we extend, if we prolong uh, the decision that we make by slowing down and stopping, well, that doesn't really work with the example, but if we prolong the decision, uh, then that doesn't negate, uh, according to Lamport, that Burdan's principle is at play. It's simply, uh, it's simply saying that we recognize that we're in a position that we can't make a decision. Maybe if I wait a little bit longer, I might be able to uh, come to some sort of solution. And if you recall, that's actually the very thing that, in a different light, uh, Jean Burdin was saying that like, when faced with two 
morally equal, but, uh, but divergent and differing uh, choices to make, the only thing that you can do is wait until the situation changes and then make a new uh, and then make your decision based upon new facts. But it still doesn't negate the fact that you're in a position of indecision by virtue of the circumstances. Hey. Hey. Hi. Um, so I was like a bit of a morbid child, and uh, I thought about this problem that reminds me of this, which is like two planes are kind of headed towards each other, right? Mm -hmm. And they're trying to resolve how to get out of each other's way. Mm -hmm. And both pilots have the exact same idea, like, okay, we'll both go up, and then, oh, shit, no, let's, we'll both go down. So it's, it's this problem. Yep. And just thinking about it, I was like, what's a unique piece of information about each plane that could resolve this? And I'm like, okay, each plane has a unique tail number. What if we pick the lower tail number? Is a way out of this problem a unique piece of information? So not always going left, let's say, but that each decision has some unique preset to it that allows your way a way out of this problem. So that's sort of the same question as asked uh, the very first time. Yeah, I, I think the it means. means so. Yeah. So like, first off, uh, there is an example in the paper that I skipped over of two planes that potentially collide in midair. Uh, maybe I should have gone over it after all. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's all right. Most of you didn't. Um, but the problem uh, with that is Burdan's principle, as stated in the paper, uh, is the, the means for making the decisions irrelevant. What, what matters is that we're limited in time to make the decision, and the fact that we're making a relatively binary or discrete decision based upon what could potentially be an infinite number of possibilities and within that a lot of time, we simply can't make that decision. So to try to put a little bit more of a practical spin on the plane example and two planes trying to collide, uh, maybe colliding midair, uh, the infinitesimal small starting positions of both of these planes such that they're about to uh, collide into each other is probably going to negate the ability to uh, uh, communicate with one another uh, simply because they're unable to respond anyway to the situation uh, because they're in that moment of panic and fright. It, yeah, so it does seem different from the ass, but the difference with the ass is that uh, it starves uh, between the time uh, uh, that it takes to make the decision and actually getting to the bale of hay as proposed uh, in the construction by Lamport. Right, so I guess what I'm saying is if the planes have some way of resolving, let's just assume they can communicate faster than they're traveling. If they have a unique data datum about each of them that they can resolve it, 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 or I'm, I'm missing the point, it's that they'll just collide, right? Yeah, so again, the, the means of making the decision and the actor in making the decision is still irrelevant to the fact that there still exists a small possibility where, where decision is simply impossible. And then, you know, if the planes pilot after that fact in, in T equals, you know, much further in the future, uh, the pilots remember like, oh, well, just like, always go right, you know? Uh, then maybe they won't crash, but there still always exists that possibility that they, that they will. And just to play with this example a little bit more, if the planes are actually spaceships and they're going at the speed of light, they can't communicate faster than that, so. <laughs> Space collision. I can't quite find it, but it seems intuitively that there's some connection here to like the halting problem, right? Yes. Yes. Could you talk about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's one of the other asses I wanted to describe and just couldn't get it right. Come to the bar after, we'll talk about it. <laughs> Definitely not on video. <laughs> hey, okay. okay. So, the decision procedures mm -hmm. over time are in indexed by the initial starting position. If you start at a goal, you stay there, which means that the continuity constraint means that there has to be a continuous deformation between the function starting at one goal to the other, aka a homotope. That doesn't make any sense at all. No, it doesn't. <laughs> okay. We agree on that point. Yes. Okay, good. 
And also, but if you start at a goal, if you start at, uh, if the ash starts at one, it doesn't have to make a decision. No, it doesn't. Right. Right. It's, yes, but like, so I guess what I'm trying, to, well, the subtext of that is that there has been no discussion at all about the asses themselves, mm -hmm. right? Which I think that like, when you're talking about this like finite, like area of time wherein the ass will starve, that's completely dependent on the properties of the ass. Right? For example, like the speed at which it can move, or like how hungry it is, or like a million other things. So to say simply that like there's this finite set of things where like you're not gonna, I mean, it's not even like saying that the ass is going to start, it's just saying that this function has its property, and then everything else is dependent on the ass. Right. This seems a little ridiculous. It seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? Well, not kind of ridiculous, but not counterintuitive, just like Absolutely. it doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. No, 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 I don't think so. I mean, like, you can reduce it to a situation where you have, uh, like, a bound, like these functions that are just unbounded intervals that are that are closed. Well, I feel actually the original paper is discussing the situation that okay, you may possibly make decisions, right? Mm -hmm. Or you're asked right now, you're the ask, okay, you have so many different cases. From your position to this other stuff, no matter what you are, you probably determine by the cost function. So now you definitely cost, can. You're saying a cost function. Yeah, kind of cost, cost function. function. Cost. cost. Okay. So the cost function, okay, right now you may have some point over there. Your cost function are also equal. If your decision principle is actually deciding, okay, which cost function you can do, you cannot do anything right now. Your position, initial position, the cost you actually cannot make any decisions. No, but that's yeah, that's. But that's only that's only if like you assume this continuity constraint, which doesn't make any sense. I feel like the cost function is also the cost function. Any questions yeah. I can answer? Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, Spiros and I were talking about this uh, oh God. before and no no I, he, so he actually gave an ass, which which like really solidified it for me, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> which was uh, <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, really, um, Spiros? Yeah. Well, he about flip flops, about like like electrical components, mm -hmm. uh, which makes which you you mentioned with the glitch problem, right? Which if a flip flop um, has a voltage, and you know it. It uh, it has a continuous function, right? Like it it the the voltage is continuous. Well, the measurement of the voltage right. is continuous. Right. So the yeah the the, the voltage at time t given the starting voltage mm -hmm. uh, is continuous. Then yeah, like it, it it's very clear that like there is going to be a range of voltages where for that time t you're not going to have converged on zero volts or five volts. Yeah, um, flies right through the gate past the arbiter. You got a half right. bit. That, that makes total sense. But what, what, what Spiros is saying about like making a decision, like that is not a continuous function in the sense that I don't go from like, like completely undecided to 100% yes, like in a continuous way, like with time. Well, okay, so this is you still- You can over time. Um, no, but the claim was never that the decision function had to be continuous. The claim right, that, that, that the yeah. state space between the two yeah. goals is exactly. Yeah, you could this right. so right, like right, right. that's that's one of the things that you could do instead of extending time, you could uh, give up the the fact that you make it a discrete decision and make the continuous decisions. Right. Where right. your decision is bound by continuity, just like the inputs of the decision. So you're no longer uh, you're no longer trying to make a binary choice uh, based off of a constant flow that's a function over time, uh, but rather uh, it's a compound function between the two. Right, right, right. So yeah, so I get it. So it's like, I have an input and I don't know. Okay, I can't, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll think about this more. And okay. You, yeah. Well, that means the, like, the decision can be discontinuous, right? Then actually the problem is not there, right? The problem is a continuous function at a fixed point since. So that's why there must be some point in not make anything. Right. That's my semantics. Is there a question?
<laughs> so if you can break stuff, if there's a problem over there, probably the only way to solve that one is just discretize the cost part, but I don't know how. Well, you just, yeah, I mean like, if, if the cost function is making a decision, yeah, so, and that's the exact problem. You could actually give up discreteness in your, in your decision making, but, you know, that's not avoiding or invalidating Burdan's principle, it's a completely different situation entirely. Yeah. Now, Spiros isn't allowed to ask questions anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess, okay, so I still don't understand the connection between anything that he was talking about and Burdan's principle. <laughs> well, Burdan's principle is like what he was talking about. What? Burdan's principle is what he was talking about. You're yeah, talking I, about Burdan's ass or Burdan's principle? Like the paradox, the original paradox, or the actual principle? Both. Okay. Like it just doesn't so I think, connect. I think he was just thinking so, it, about the ass, I think he was talking about the ass to be Q. Right, but like um, the question really is, is like this paper a massive troll? So. <laughs> yeah, um, that's for us to decide really. I'm still a little unconvinced. Um, it seems like you're not. Yeah, uh, and, and I could see how uh, Burdan's principle is at play in things like FLP and possibility, but it still doesn't sit right. Uh, and this is after having read the paper probably about like 20, 30 times, uh, reading all of nothing that exists on the internet in the form of commentary on it, um, except for one blog post, which was horrible. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I'm gonna have to write the second horrible blog post about it. Um, so the thing is, like as Lamport says, find a counterexample. I can't think of a counterexample despite not the fact, despite the examples not sitting well with me. And mathematically, it does seem sound to the limits of my mathematical ability. Uh, so that's the thing even when lamport has cited this paper himself he says that we take it as axiom you know in the same sense that we take the shortest distance between two points in euclidean space is a straight line i mean like that seems a little bit more reasonable <laughs> okay, okay but yeah <laughs> one more who wants the last question this guy yeah, yeah, or the one the guy that said he had a question Does Burden's principle say anything about the computability of the coordinates where the ass can't make up its mind? I think so. <laughs> not in that sense. I'm talking about not quite in that sense. I'm talking like there are real, there are computable real numbers, and then there are non-computable real numbers, uh, which I think is a different form of computability than that. Is there, are there forms of the problem where the ass, in order for him to not make up his mind, has to be on a number where he couldn't even read it aloud because it's not computable anyway? Like one over a square root of negative one? As the starting position? Noah, Noah is the numbers for which no finitely long algorithm exists to describe them. Oh, um, possibly, but again, that's not even close to my area of expertise, so I really don't know. But it's interesting. I think Leaf had the last question. Yeah, I just wanted, that's actually how I thought uh, no the question paper originally. Um, how original. Was that if you are, <laughs> like let's say you're the ass and you're just saying if it's greater than or equal to exactly 0.5, I'm gonna go to the right. If it's less than that, I'm gonna go to the left. Well. Now you have to measure, like with possibly unbounded precision, where exactly am I before you make the decision? And that's kind of, if you have this, this if you're at a position that is very hard to represent or to compute, then it could take you an unbounded amount of time to come to that decision. And then you start. All right. All right. Who wants to go? Sure. Sure.